Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, SCOTUS sort of wrestling with Aristotle's version of the distinction that we've been talking about. Uh, he's going to be trying to reconcile his own uh, his own reinterpretation of the distinction with what Aristotle has to say initially, uh, and he's going to try and take, uh, from what we'll see, a kind of uh, a charitable approach to his reinterpretation. Uh, not really saying that Aristotle got it wrong, uh, but that his further interpretation is going to uh, going to take it in a new light and take it in a new direction, that sort of thing. Uh, this is a relatively short section, uh, but I'm going to keep it just to this section for today uh, because the next section is much longer, uh, so I want to give that sufficient time. Uh, so with that, let's go into it. So continuing, Article 2, the distinction in itself, what Aristotle meant. But how do things I have said comport with Aristotle's view? He does not distinguish between nature and will, but between non-rational and rational powers. And he understands only the intellect as a rational power, as the second argument given above evidently shows. Response. Intellect and will can be understood as relating either to the proper acts that they elicit or to the acts of other inferior powers over which they exercise some causality the intellect by presenting and directing, the will by inclining and commanding. The first relationship is obviously the more essential one, and the intellect, so considered, counts as nature. For it is of itself determined to understanding. It is not in the intellect's power to understand and not to understand simples, or with regard to propositions, where it can have contrary acts, assent and dissent. Those contrary acts are not in the intellect's power. Accordingly, even if, as Aristotle evidently says, there is a single cognition of opposite objects, the intellect is still not indeterminate of itself with respect to that cognition. Indeed, it necessarily elicits that intellection, just as it would necessarily elicit another intellection that would be of only one of those two opposites. The will elicits its proper act in the exactly the opposite way, as I have explained earlier. Hence, Speaking of the two powers in this way, we affirm only two productions in the Godhead, and we say that intellect is the same principle as nature, but Aristotle was evidently not speaking in terms of this first relationship. Okay, this, uh, this is the key component of his disagreement with Aristotle, uh, or maybe we should say his reinterpretation of Aristotle. Uh, it's important to note here uh, that he is talking now about uh, the the ways that rational powers work versus the ways that natural powers work, just to review. So he's talking about rational powers being those which can determine between opposites. A rational power is a power for opposites in the sense that it has the power to do A or the power to do B. It has the power to do both of them. Uh, further, it has the power to do A, also the power not to do A. And so a rational power can choose between two different things uh, because it's capable of doing both of those things, but not at the same time if those things are contradictory. Furthermore, a rational power, if it has the power to pursue some end, that also means if it's a rational power, it can not pursue that end. Right? To use the example from before, uh, your digestive system, a natural power, always is going to digest, right? Your stomach is going to digest. No matter what you put into it, it's going to digest to the fullest extent it possibly can. By contrast, you, your, your faculty of choice or your will, uh, is capable of choosing what you pick up and eat, right? what you feed your digestive system. You can choose to eat uh, one plate or a, diff or a different plate, or you can choose to eat or not eat. Right? Your stomach isn't going to choose what pieces or what parts of your meal to digest, it's not going to choose whether to digest fully or not so fully, uh, and you don't even have conscious control over such a thing, and so we call that a natural power. Scotus's point here is to point out, his what he's, uh, what he's arguing here is to say that, look, the intellect works more like the stomach than it does like the will. And he's pointing this out, uh, what he's, how he's pointing this out is to show that if the intellect is presented with a proposition, uh, or a, uh, when he says simple here, he's talking about a simple statement, right? Um, uh, an object of cognition, uh, a form which one can understand. 
when the intellect is presented with anything like this, uh, what he's uh, what he's pointing out is that the intellect will always necessarily cognize it. The intellect will understand it. Uh, it's not like the intellect is either going to understand it or not fully understand it, depending on uh, whether it intends to or not. It's just once the intellect is presented with a proposition, the intellect will determine that the proposition is true or it will determine that the proposition is false. Now, this sounds like a power for opposites, right? It can assent or dissent, as he says. However, he also says those contrary acts are not in the intellect's power. Right? It's not up to the intellect. Right? The intellect is not capable of both assenting and dissenting from a, pop, from a proposition that it determines to be true. Right? The intellect, if it determines something to be true, it will assent. That's all there is to it. If it determines a proposition to be false, it will dissent. That's all there is to it. There is no uh, the intellect being capable of assenting to a proposition it determines to be true or dissenting from a proposition it determines to be true. Right? Scotus here is pointing out, and this is par for the course for Aristotle, this part is perfectly in line with what Aristotle has to say, <clears throat> uh, that the intellect, when it is presented with something that it determines to be true, it's not a matter of choice whether that whether that proposition is assented to or not, right? When the intellect determines a proposition to be true, assent is part of that determination. That's all there is. Similarly, uh, there is a single cogni cognition of opposite objects, right? We can understand hot, we can understand cold, right? These are privative opposites. So the intellect is in this sense a power for opposites, right? Scotus is on board here, and this is his uh, interpretation of Aristotle. I think he's more or less on um, more or less on the right track in terms of interpretation here as well. This isn't a uh, cognition of opposites in the sense that a rational power is for determining between opposites. Right, a rational power is something which can do either opposite. Right? The uh, the intellect here in understanding uh, opposite objects hot or cold, for instance, is in a single act of intellection, or maybe in two separate acts of cognition, right? Either way, it doesn't, doesn't much matter which, which way it does it. It is not just capable of understanding both and has to elicit between them, has to choose between them. It's capable of understanding both because it can simply understand them both separately, right? We can understand what hot is, we can understand what cold is. There's no contradiction between understanding the two things because we're not trying to actualize either one of them uh, in anywhere beyond the intellect. Right? So it's not that it has to choose or elicit between opposites. It doesn't have to determine between opposites. The intellect merely understands both opposites. Right? And this leads us into the second kind of relationship he was talking about. So let's uh, see what he has to say about that, and this will help us to further clarify this distinction. So continuing on. The second relationship seems quasi-accidental for two reasons. First, these powers are evidently related to acts of other powers only through their own acts, which are prior to the acts of the other powers. Second, the intellect in particular, understood in terms of this second relationship, does not have the character of an active power properly speaking, as we discussed in Book 7, Question 2, Chapter 6. Aristotle was evidently speaking in terms of this second relationship, when he claimed that the sort of knowledge of opposites is required first, but that knowledge is itself insufficient for causing any external effect. For, as he argues in chapter four, if it were sufficient, it would bring about opposite effects. This evidently does not follow unless the causality of the intellect, even when he knows opposites, even when it knows opposites, is such that the intellect is determined to bring about as external effects the things it knows. And thus, not only is it not rational with respect to its own act, it is also not completely rational with respect to the external act that it directs. Indeed, strictly speaking, it is also non-rational with respect to the er external act. It is rational only in a certain respect, insofar as it is a prerequisite for the act of a rational power. What follows this prerequisite act on the part of the intellect is the will as determining, not that the power of the will is of itself determined to one, 
and that consequently the aggregate of the intellect, which is of opposites, and the will is determinately of one of a pair of opposites, as was claimed above, but that the will, which is indeterminate with respect to its own act, elicits that act through that act, uh, determines the intellect's causality with respect to bringing about its external effect. Okay, uh, so let's look at let's look at this a little more carefully. Uh, so the second the second relationship he's talking about is above um, inferior powers over which they exercise some causality. Uh, what he's implying here is that the intellect presents choices to the will that the will then chooses. The intellect is providing the uh, the cognitive basis for a choice. It's presenting options. It's it is giving the the raw information that allows the will to make a choice. Right. And so we can say that the intellect is a power for opposites in this sense. The intellect. Uh, presents the raw data for the will to make a choice, so that means it is a uh, it is a part of the process of making a choice. But he wants to point out that that's not that's not as relevant, right? That's not quite the the important part of the choice making. Right? Um, we don't want to say it's um. Let's give it a, an Aristotelian analogy, right? Um, the intellect presenting the information for making a choice or presenting the choices to be chosen between, so to speak. Uh, what this, uh, what, what we can call this is something like, um, we can call this something like, uh, we can analogize, analogize it at least, to the, uh, the material cause of something. So what I mean is, uh, if we were to build something, say we were carving a statue to use Aristotle's example, Right, we we would say that in a sense the marble that we're carving it out of is the cause of the statue, but it's only the material cause. Right, it is what the statue is made out of. We are the ones who cause it in the active sense. Right, uh, the the sculptor or his power of sculpting is the active power at play. It is the efficient cause. It is providing the formal cause uh, of the statue that is made out of marble. Similarly, and not exactly, again, this is only an analogy. I don't want to say that the intellect is providing the material cause of choices per se. That's, again, by analogy. The intellect is providing the material, so to speak, for the will to make the choice, right? To, to, to uh, inform the choice in the sense of, of, of delineating between these opposites that the intellect is presenting. And so the will is what is ultimately making the choice after the intellect provides it with sufficient information for it to make that choice. So in this sense, uh, he says that the intellect in this second relationship, uh, it does not have the character of an active power, properly speaking. Right? So it's not actively making the choice, the intellect is not actively making the choice in this respect, uh, it's just providing what the will needs in order to make the choice. Okay. So all of that is a kind of a summary of what, what, he, is, what he has said here. Right? So the, the intellect in this sense is not uh, what elicits the external act, it's just it's kind of part of what leads to the external act. It's also worth noting that the intellect's presentation of uh, presentation of this choice to the will to make the choice, right? Uh, we can't say that that is, uh, he says, we can't say that it's sufficient for bringing about the ultimate effect, right? Because if it were sufficient, then that would mean that the intellect is fully determining the choice and that the choice would therefore, because the intellect is a natural power, that means that the choice would occur by necessity which would mean that it is not a choice, it is simply a happening, it would be an event, right? It would be something akin to digestion rather than something akin to a rational judgment or rational choice. And so that can't be the case, right? It is not fully sufficient for uh, bringing about the opposite effect. Uh, and he also points out here that if the intellect were sufficient for bringing about opposite effects, then that would mean that the intellect has to be capable of opposites, 
in the more robust sense that we already said that it wasn't. So if we go back to above, right, that would have to mean that the intellect is capable of cognizing uh, the same object both positively and negatively, right? The intellect would be, have to be capable in this sense of assenting and dissenting from the same proposition, even after it determines it to be true or to be false. Right? It's not capable of doing so. Right? It would have to be capable if it's capable of producing either effect ultimately. And Scoda says, no, no, that's not possible. We need some more, uh, more immediate cause, he's gonna say the power of will, in order to elicit opposite effects given what the intellect presents to it. So the intellect here, even if it is a power for opposites in this kind of shallow sense, it is not an active power in that sense. It's just sort of providing the material to the active power. <clears throat> uh, the active power of the intellect is the power for cognition, and insofar it is a power for cognition, in other words, for understanding things, in that respect, it is a natural power, not a rational power. Okay, so let's move on to uh, to the next uh, next part of this, uh, his his um, interpretation of Aristotle. This is why Aristotle says, "I call this desire or prohiresis, that is choice. He does not call it will, that is a power. So, if Aristotle does call the intellect a rational power." The distinction between rational and non-rational powers must be understood in the way he explained above. The intellect is not a rational power either with respect to its own act or insofar as through its own act it cooperates with the act of an inferior power, taking its own act strictly. But rather, in both respects, it counts as nature. It does, however, count as a rational power insofar as its own acts are prerequisites for the acts of the will. And this is basically the same thing that we've just said above, uh, that the intellect here is a rational power, but not a rational power in the active sense. It's a rational power insofar as it is part of a rational action. It is, the, it is a prerequisite for the will, which is itself an active power. So continuing, if by contrast, we understand rational as meaning with reason, then the will is properly rational. And the will is a power for opposites, not only with respect to its own acts, but also with respect to the acts of inferior powers. It is not a power for opposites in the way that nature is like the intellect, which cannot determine itself uh, to one or the other of a pair of opposites. Rather, it can freely determine itself. And this is why it is a power. It can do something, for it can determine itself. The intellect, by contrast, is not a power with respect to external things, for if it has to do with opposites, it cannot determine itself. And unless it is determined, it cannot do anything externally. All right, so his point here uh, is again, to distinguish between the will and the intellect. The will he thinks is the rational power. It's a, properly speaking, it is a power for opposites. It can determine itself to one or the other of a pair of opposites or of between many, uh, many alternatives. Right? The intellect, uh, is rational only in the sense that it is with reason. It can think, it can judge, it can, it can make determinations between opposites, but not because it's capable of both opposites, but because it can, uh, it can understand things and those things that it understands have opposites and it can understand both of them, you know, simultaneously, not, uh, not in the way that the will does by determining between the opposites. So here uh, I want to also uh, I want to also look at uh, what he says about uh, about the will and the intellect as separate powers because this is I think one of the key parts where he is reinterpreting where he's making a significant change uh, to what Aristotle has to say right. uh, because he points out that he calls uh, he, what he calls choice is not a power right. for Aristotle he doesn't talk about the will. Uh, even for most of the scholastics, they don't talk about the will as its own faculty or as its own power, as its own the, as its own uh, capacity or power or activity or thing that we rational creatures do. Right? The will is for Aristotle and for the previous scholastics. Uh, for Aristotle, it is an action, 
we will something, we choose something, we desire something, uh, right? All of these are the same thing for Aristotle. Uh, it is an action of the intellect. The earlier scholastics, uh, Aquinas in particular, will take a similar, uh, similar route for this, and they will say that, well, the will is not, right? I mean, he wouldn't even quite say the will like Scotus would. He would say an act of willing, right? So uh, for Aquinas or for Thomist, an act of willing is an activity of the intellect. It is the intellect's determination between opposites, choosing, choosing in a sense, one over the other. But it does so by its own intellectual activity, by reason, by cognition. Scotus wants to pull these things apart and say, well, look, the intellect seems to be doing two completely different things here. On the one hand, the intellect is cognizing, it is understanding things. But on the other hand, it is eliciting between opposites. And so Scotus says, well, if the intellect, if this one power is doing completely different and apparently almost unrelated actions, then we should consider these two things to be different powers of the rational creature. Right? Because it's not like we're talking about little, you know, little components in the mind. We're not talking about, you know, different different components of a chipset or something. We're talking about the different things that a rational creature can do. And if we're talking about different things that it can do, well, we can talk about different powers. And this is the main distinction that Scotus wants to make. He wants to distinguish between intellect and will, not merely as different activities, right? Not merely as different things that we rationally can do, but he wants to say that, look, these are different capacities. These are different activities that we can do. And so they are, um, they are importantly different. It's important to distinguish between them and say that, well, the intellect is, as we've been kind of saying, part of a rational power, if you will. And it's part of our capacity for choice. It is used for our capacity for choice. But the intellect, strictly speaking, is a natural power. It's the power of our cognition. And we should distinguish that from our power for choice. The reasons he does this are, uh, are first of all, just for clarity. He wants to make more and more distinctions. He wants to, because that's kind of the scholastic habit, right? We want to try to make as many distinctions as we possibly can, as long as they're meaningful distinctions. Uh, and he does want to say, look, this is a meaningful distinction. These are two different things that we as rational creatures can do. We can think about stuff and we can choose between stuff. But he also wants to make this, uh, make this important distinction for another reason. He wants to make it clear um, that we are not determined in our choices simply by external stimuli or external uh, the facts about the world, facts about the choice that we make. Right? He wants to emphasize by separating out the will from the intellect that, that our cognitions are not purely what determine our choices, right? Understanding, or so he wants to, he wants to limit, he wants to kind of pull away from, uh, from the, the, uh, what we would call the intellectualist tradition, <clears throat> uh, dating, uh, going back uh, in particular to Plato, really. Uh, Plato, who said, to know the good is to do the good. Scotus thinks that there's kind of a space in between those things, right? Between knowing what is good and doing it. Because the intellect can cognize something as good, can understand that something is good, but the will can choose between multiple desirable outcomes, multiple goods right but sometimes the will does not choose the best good right we know this just simply from our own experience we often will choose something that is inferior in some ways than others and so our choice is between these opposites and so scotus thinks that this this distinction making this distinction as clear as possible uh, and separating out these two different powers is the clearest and uh and most robust way of explaining how it is that we choose um, between different potential goods, right? different things that we cognize as good. And so it doesn't just turn out to be an, an operation of the intellect of figuring out, well, what's the best course of action and then just automatically doing it. And it couldn't be another way. Scotus wants to say, no, no, it could be another way. And we see this wind up being quite important for ethical responsibility and all sorts of other things like that. Um, 
So I want to just point the not only what this distinction is, but its importance here and why he emphasizes this new distinction, uh, because this is more or less new uh, in terms of the scholastic um, metaphysical psychology, um, that, that the intellect and the will are different powers within human reason. All right, so I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, so I will leave us here uh, and we will pick up next time uh, looking at uh, sort of responses to the Aristotelian position and some potential problems and some potential solutions. Uh, so with that, I will see everyone next time. Bye.